Thank you, Lee, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In my presentation this afternoon, I'll be providing you an overview of the key trends in the meat and live animal export industries, our market outlook for these industries over the medium term, and some of the challenges facing the meat and livestock sector. While I touch on some animal welfare issues, uh, these will be addressed in more detail by the speakers to follow, Mark, Malcolm, and Lynn. I'll start by looking at some of the key trends and the outlook for beef and sheep meat. We are currently seeing return to growth in beef cattle slaughter after five years of declining turnoff. After a couple of very good seasons which encouraged herd rebuilding, beef cattle numbers are estimated to have built up to their highest level in over 30 years, forecast at over 26 million. Dry conditions, particularly in the southern states, are putting a halt to further herd rebuilding intentions. With lower demand for restocker cattle and increased supplies of cattle for slaughter, sale yard prices are forecast to fall 7% this year and a further 3% next year. Over the medium term, sale yard beef cattle prices are projected to decline in real terms as cattle slaughter and beef production increase. <clears throat> in 2013-14, with a forecast upturn in wool prices, just uh, make sure that's... I jump through? That's where I want to be, I think, yes. With the forecast upturn in wool prices, we're expecting to see some building up of weathers in the sheep flock for wool production, reducing both prime lamb supplies and adult sheep for slaughter. This is forecast to result in average sale yard prices increasing next year, by 4% for lambs and by 5% for sheep. Over the medium term, both lamb and mutton production are projected to grow, resulting in lamb and sheep sale yard prices declining in real terms. So let's have a look at beef and sheep farm incomes. The average beef industry farm cash income is forecast to increase slightly this year as drier seasonal conditions result in increased turnoff of beef cattle. Prices are expected to be lower, but the increase in sale numbers together with some further cutbacks in cattle purchases and along with lower interest rates are forecast to result in a small increase in beef industry incomes. For sheep producers, incomes are forecast to be down this year as lower prices for sheep, lambs, and wool are projected to result in reduction in incomes for sheep industry farms from the highs of the previous two years. With the increase in beef production over the medium term, beef exports are forecast to rise to over one million tonnes in shipped weight terms. While year-to-year -year changes are quite small, what's more interesting is the shifting destinations of those exports. Around 65% of Australia's exports go to three key markets, which you can see as Japan, the United States, and the Republic of Korea. But what you can see here is the growing importance of other smaller and emerging markets over the outlook period. The Australian beef export trade has rapidly diversified over the past several years with strong growth in exports to China, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And Russia is another important, although lately volatile, market. <coughs> Indonesia had been growing in importance until the recent boxed beef import quotas imposed by the Indonesian government. For 2013, Indonesia is limiting beef imports to 32,000 tonnes from all sources. With Japan loosening its BSE-related restrictions on US imports, demand for Australian beef is projected to fall as we face increasing competition from US beef returning to the Japanese market. From the 1st of February 2013, access has been expanded to US beef from cattle 30 months of age or younger, which means around 90% of the US herd is now eligible for that market, whereas only 25% had been eligible since 2005. The Korea-United States Free Trade Agreement will have an increasing impact over the medium term. Growth in exports to Korea is likely to slow if Australian beef is subject to an increasingly higher tariff relative to US beef. Australian lamb exports are forecast to fall in the short term, reflecting lower lamb production, but to rise over the medium term as production grows. The Middle East, the United States, and China are the three most important markets for lamb and growth in our exports to all three is expected over the medium term. Mutton exports are also forecast to rise over the medium term with growth in traditional markets in the Middle East as well as emerging markets in Southeast Asia and China. Turning to live cattle exports, Australian exports of live cattle for feeder and slaughter purposes are forecast to fall by 22% to around 450,000 head in 2012-13 and to remain around that level in 2013-14. Indonesia, 
which is the key market for Australia's live cattle exports since the mid-1990s, began imposing restrictions on live cattle imports in 2010 in pursuit of its policy of beef self-sufficiency by 2014. Indonesia's import quota for this year is 267,000 head, which is 16,000 head fewer than last year and around half of the 2011 quota. Over the medium term, growth in exports of live cattle will depend on Indonesia's trade policy and the development of new markets for northern Australian cattle. Live sheep exports are forecast to decline in this year to their lowest level in more than 20 years, mainly reflecting the trade disruptions associated with unloading animals in Bahrain in August last year. A 12% increase to around 2 million head is forecast next year. Assuming there are no trade disruptions, live sheep exports are projected to recover slowly over the outlook period. I'd like to put these live exports into context in terms of the total value of Australia's meat and live animal exports. In 2013-14, live cattle exports are forecast to reach $330 million worth and live sheep $252 million, compared with $4.7 billion for beef and $1.3 billion for lamb and mutton. Pig meat and poultry exports are much smaller slices of the pie at $87 million and $51 million respectively. Let's quickly take a look at those two industries. In 2012-13, the Australian pig industry has been pressured by escalating feed costs and growing import competition, while pig prices have averaged similar to last year at around 280 cents a kilogram. In 2013-14, these pressures are forecast to result in lower breeding sow numbers. At 2.2 million head, the Australian pig herd is the lowest in 40 years. Lower pig meat production next year is forecast to lead to pig prices increasing by 3%. Lower feed grain prices, which account for around half of production costs, should support a partial recovery in pig numbers and pig meat production over the medium term. But with the Australian dollar assumed to remain relatively strong, demand for imported pig meat is projected to rise. We turn now to poultry, where projected growth in chicken meat production over the medium term is largely in response to increased consumer demand, as retail prices are expected to remain substantially lower than for beef, lamb and pork. By 2017-18, chicken meat production is projected to be around 1.2 million tonnes, compared to an estimated 1 million tonnes for 2012-13. The Australian chicken meat industry continues to import new genetic strains that enable producers to improve a number of traits, including meat yield per bird, feed conversion efficiency, and disease resistance. <clears throat> so turning to some of the key issues, I'd like to expand on a number of these which we think will influence the outlook going forward. Productivity growth increasingly important when faced with declining real prices, food demand in the longer term, foreign trade policy issues, and animal welfare issues at home and abroad. So as well as increased agricultural production, productivity growth helps ease the effect on farmers' incomes of a persistent decline in their terms of trade. You can see here growth in broadacre agricultural productivity has for the last decade been underpinned by growth in the beef and sheep industries. Northern beef producers have seen greater improvements in productivity than southern producers, which can be attributed to improvements in animal health, increased investment in on-farm infrastructure, and improved cattle management systems. The improvement in sheep productivity is largely due to improvement in management practices and changes in the flock composition. Food demand in the longer term, which was discussed in uh, yesterday's session, particularly in developing countries, will be increasingly important for Australia's meat and livestock industries. ABARE's research into global food demand to 2050 found that the real, world, uh, the real value of world food demand will increase by 75% by 2050. And most of this growth in demand is expected to come from Asia. Growth in meat demand is expected to grow even faster than this, doubling by 2050. The slide shows projections of growth in Asian beef consumption by 2050. And you can see here very little growth in demand in Japan and Korea, but strong growth in developing Asia, with much of this coming from China. Growing incomes and increased demand for animal proteins in diets in developing countries are driving this demand. Australia will need to remain competitive to meet the opportunities provided by higher global food demand. With Australia facing land and water constraints, it will be increasingly important to maintain productivity growth through ongoing investment in research and development so that we're well positioned to take advantage of this growth in demand. Improved access to markets is necessary for success in growing international trade. Changes to foreign trade policies and import protocols 
pose risks to growth in Australia's meat and livestock trade. Three examples of policy changes I've already spoken about earlier include Indonesia's beef self-sufficiency policies, Japan's loosening of BSE-related import restrictions, and the Korea-US free trade agreement. <clears throat> Prior to the imposition of Indonesia's import quotas, Australia supplied around one-third of Indonesia's beef, either through feeder cattle or imported beef. It's important that government and industry continue to work on the trading relationship with Indonesia, demonstrating the synergies between us in beef production and assuring them of our role in their food security. Japan's loosening of its BSE-related restrictions on US imports is expected to result in falling demand for Australian beef is projected to fall as we face increasing competition from US beef returning to the Japanese market. Finally, the Korea-United States Free Trade Agreement will have an increasing impact over the medium term if we fail to negotiate our own agreement with Korea. And that was a subject of discussion at yesterday's talk by the Trade Minister, Minister Emerson. Animal welfare concerns pose a serious risk to both the live cattle and live sheep trade, with a number of animal welfare groups seeking to end the live animal trade for all livestock species. The Australian industry has strict protocols in place for treatment of animals in transit and at point of delivery to minimise stress on animals. The industry has also spent a number of years in destination countries undertaking education and technical extension to improve handling and welfare of animals for slaughter. The airing on national television and social media of video footage taken by animal welfare activists of animal cruelty in a number of Indonesian abattoirs led to a public outcry against the live export trade and the temporary suspension of the trade with Indonesia in June 2011. Some commentators spoke of the industry losing its social license to operate, an intangible permission the community gives when an activity gains ongoing approval or broad social acceptance. In response to these events, the Australian government has implemented a through-chain animal welfare assurance framework, the Exporter Supply Chain Assurance System, or SCAS. SCAS ensures that all Australian livestock exported for feeder or slaughter is treated at or above World Organisation for Animal Health Standards. Social licence also extends to domestic production of animals, and it is the consumer ultimately through commercial pressure applied by the retail sector that imposes changes. Two examples are the use of sow stalls and cages in egg production. And Lee mentioned a couple of others in his opening remarks. On the use of sow stalls, the European Union and New Zealand have legislated to ban sow stalls. In Australia, the industry is voluntarily committed to phase them out by 2017. However, Coles Supermarket announced that all Coles branded pork products will be supplied from producers that do not use sow stalls by January 2013. As well, Woolworths has claimed that all their fresh pork products will be sow stall free by mid-2013. On the use of battery cages in egg production, regulations have been implemented in the European Union and California, laying down minimum standards for the protection of laying hens. In New Zealand, the phase out of battery cages over 10 years was announced in December 2012. In Australia, battery cages are permitted under national standards, but Tasmania has announced a ban on construction of new cage egg infrastructure and a cap on cage egg production at 2012 levels. And so, to quickly sum up, <clears throat> the outlook for Australian livestock industries is for increased production over the medium term. Given this, and an assumed relatively strong dollar, prices are projected to decline in real terms over the projection period. With prices declining in real terms, productivity growth is the means by which Australian farmers increase production and remain competitive. Higher global food demand will offer many opportunities for Australian producers, but it will be increasingly important to maintain productivity growth through investment in research and development. Improved access to markets is necessary for success in growing international trade. Working on key trading relationships is important to offset the risks of adverse foreign trade policy changes. Animal welfare issues are playing an increasingly important role in our livestock industries. Through social license or broad community approval, it is ultimately the consumer through commercial pressure that imposes those changes. Thank you. <clears throat>